Uh, let me uh, just say that I've tried to sort of take this opportunity to not just express some thoughts on this subject which is here, uh, thoughts around CPAC, around structural reforms and much needed competitiveness of private enterprise, but also to take this opportunity to introduce the book uh, which was released earlier this year. And essentially this is, these are the areas that the book talks about, you know. Uh, we start off with a very basic uh, premise which takes a background of the economy and what we are suggesting is that uh, CPEC, the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor has provided a new narrative to the Pakistan economy. It was much needed. It has created a lot of growth momentum in the economy. Uh, however, we also make this argument that what is coming to us under CPEC or what we are getting as infrastructure endowment is not new to Pakistan, right? Uh, this is exactly or maybe similar to what the Americans had given us in the 1950s and 60s. The key question is that how did we use what the Americans had given us, you know? They had given us roads, bridges, dams, waterways. They had built uh, a lot of this stuff back in uh, 50s and 60s. Uh, the key issue is that we sort of managed that infrastructure weakly. And because of that weak uh, management of infrastructure, we couldn't optimally use it for the growth of our economy. And uh, over here, of course, I've taken a more narrower definition of economic growth, which is the growth of private enterprise in this country and our integration, trade and investment integration with the rest of the world, particularly the region. The background of the book also tells you that one now needs to think beyond CPEC as CPEC's early harvest projects are now coming to an end, and many of them are coming to a very timely end, uh, what we now need to think is, uh, how, does, how does this CPEC now benefit the local businesses, particularly small and medium enterprise? They will only benefit the SMEs if we are able to bring down the cost of doing business in Pakistan, right? And bringing down cost of doing business requires some structural reforms which this book calls about. Uh, you also get CPEX dividends. If you're able to share uh, these dividends, you'll be able to optimize your dividends if you're able to dividends with your region, particularly the neighboring countries. And we then provide examples of how CPEX node, no, nodes can be connected with Iran, Afghanistan, Central Asia, uh, even India, China, and beyond. Uh, so it's extremely important that, that this should remain a dynamic subject. Uh, now, why was the book attempted? Firstly, of course, to provide a non-technical understanding of economic discourse in this country. Uh, we have tried to make this discourse as less technical as possible in the book so that non-economists, journalists, policymakers, students can follow what is what are the key issues in the economy and what's the way forward. We also wanted to take a stock of economic outcomes after the 18th Amendment. And the economy has significantly changed. The, the way we govern uh, the economy, set policies and regulations has significantly changed after the 18th Amendment. And then finally, uh, our own work uh, in uh, STPI, of course, uh, where we feel uh, that while policy debate has increased in the country as a result of our work and the work of many of the think tanks in the country, uh, but uptake still remains a challenge. So policy debate has increased, which is good. Awareness about policy debates is increasing. Key issues highlighted in pu public policy is increasing. But uptake at the civil servant level, at the parliament level, that uptake still remains a challenge. So if you were to ask me in the last seven years how much of the policy advice actually found its way in legislation, policy, uh, program and projects, public projects, uh, that's a much harder question to respond to. Uh, but of course the book tries to uh, attempt some reasons to the third question as well. Now, we start off with, uh, with mentioning or at least discussing four lessons that uh, we have learned as a country the hard way. We first of all learned that rule of law or the absence of rule of law or a weak rule of, rule of law hampers long-term growth prospects. Second, the delays in legal and judicial reforms 
have accentuated economic uh, governance challenges, in turn threatening the sustainability of growth in the country. Third, public administration reform has decreased efficiency and effectiveness of both taxation as well as where those taxes are spent, which is public spending. And then finally, uh, uh, the corruption in institutions of economic governance has affected the private enterprise and led to their increased cost of doing business in Pakistan. Uh, but with these four lessons, uh, there has been some progress in the country as well, which, which of course is, is worth mentioning if you look at a cross-section of countries. So if I were to look at control of corruption, government effectiveness, regulatory quality, political stability, and uh, of course, uh, unfortunately, the data comes with a lag on these indicators. Not uh, all countries report data in the similar year. So you're looking at 2014 here. So uh, while yes, in terms of political stability and violence, we haven't done that well uh, across a cross section of countries. But despite of all that political stability and violence, uh, in case of control of corrup corruption, the country has moved towards the right hand side amongst better performing countries. Uh, in case of regulatory quality as well, we have slightly moved uh, ahead. Uh, a lot more uh, needs to be done, of course. And why do I say that a lot more needs to be done? Because for us, uh, as students of Pakistan economy, uh, what may be more important is not a comparison with the rest of the world. What may be more important is a comparison with whatever we were last year. And that, of course, uh, remains a concern. If you look at the time series of these variables, again, control of corruption, government effectiveness, regulatory quality. I've also added the rule of law index here and the voice and accountability index. What you see is that in most indicators, the change is towards improvement, but very small, very incremental. The only place where the country has moved fast is the voice and accountability measure which really shows the rise of civil society organizations uh, and non-government organizations, uh, media's voice in, in, in the discourse around uh, accountability in Pakistan. That is one indicator where you see very sharp improvement in the country. Now, uh, the second part of the book talks about uh, institutions of economic governance as basis for competitiveness, of course, we haven't worked on all institutions in the country, but the four or five that we have worked with are listed over here. Uh, we have a detailed chapter on finance ministry's reform, planning department, commerce ministry, federal board of revenue, and then their attached departments like trade development authority of Pakistan, board of investment, and provincial economic departments. Now, what you see after studying these institutions is three cross-cutting issues, basically. The first, and, and they apply to all, all the uh, economic governance institutions. The first issue is the human resource. We really haven't moved forward in these institutions to implement a detailed, comprehensive, long-term civil service reform or as others would call it, reform of public administration. Currently, you have three or four th different types of civil service. Some are federally recruited, some come through the provincial civil service cadre, and then there would be some people who would be not from Federal Public Service Commission, not from provincial service commissions, but different ones, you know, uh, who would be recruited by departments, whom you also called ex cadres you know, technical people. Second, you still have accounting systems that are not minimizing wastages and leakages. I'll give you an example in a while. And third, you really need to shed the non-essential tasks in the above mentioned institutions. You find it hard to believe that why should Ministry of Finance be trading in the wheat market? Why should Ministry of Finance be trading in the sugar market? Why should, it, why should the government ever be a player in the commodity markets? You know? uh, why should Ministry of Commerce be concerned with State Life Corporation of Pakistan. So, so, so these ministries have, have sort of, uh, they're carrying those, those non-essential tasks which are really draining them out and draining their capacity out. We, in, in, in the second aspect, we also point out 
that there is a missing link between economic governance institutions, which are at two levels. The federal economic institutions and provincial economic institutions. So provincial finance department, provincial industries department, provincial agriculture department. Then you have somewhere accountability institutions, and then you have somewhere regulatory institutions. So the Venn diagram hasn't got an intersection. The executive, accountability institutions, and regulatory institutions, all three had to work at somewhere. There had to be an interface. They had to work uh, in sync with each other. Uh, that is uh, missing. And how do we demonstrate this in the book? We demonstrate this using three examples. Firstly, we look at the Constitution. And we believe that one really needs to look at the Constitution of Pakistan. And those of you who have read it, uh, they would know that it gives clear guidance regarding the role of each of these three institutions which I have said. And I derive my learning basically from four uh, key things that go into the Constitution. First is Article 18. Article 18 asks the state for freedom of trade, business, and professions. Article 38 provide, asks the state for responsibility to promote social and economic well-being of the people. And then there, is, there are details of how that has to be ensured. Article 73 provides procedures with respect to money bill. Article 77 ensures taxes which are to be levied by law. Article 74 provides rules for expenditure. Now, each of these four articles, any amendment to practice cannot be done without the approval of parliament. So here lies the first example, that we introduce different forms of new taxes during the year, several times a year, without going to the parliament. We just do it as a notification from Ministry of Finance, FBR, or any other relevant authority. So the Constitution is violated almost on a very frequent basis. Then, the 18th Constitutional Amendment brought with it some changes in the structure of this economic governance. Article 154.1 states that the Council shall formulate and regulate policies in relation to matters in Part 2 of the Federal Legislative List and shall exercise supervision and control over related institutions. Article 156.2 states that National Economic Council shall review the overall economic conditions of the country and shall, for advising the federal government and provincial governments, formulate plans in respect of financial, commercial, social, and economic policies. I believe that if any one of us is a student of economics or student of accountability in this country, they need to go through these articles which I have mentioned. And we all, as researchers, as people who are involved in policy engagement, really need to see how do we go back to the Constitution, to at least these articles of the Constitution. This is how the practice is currently. The federal economic governance starts from the parliament and then comes down to CCI, which is then split across departments that come under prime minister and departments that come under chief minister's office. Unfortunately, below the CCI level, there is no working group, intergovernmental arrangement, or intergovernment coordination that allows provinces or provincial economic managers to talk with federal economic managers. And hence, we have seen the development strategies, the growth strategies of all provinces going in all the different directions after the 18th Amendment. Nothing bad about it. The only thing that you miss is minimum standards for development. For example, the sustainable development goals. How do you coordinate the SDGs is, 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 then becomes a challenge. You know, It just can't be done by a small office in the PM's secretariat or having a small secretariat in the planning commission maybe. 
there has to be something other than that. So one of the things that we propose is further strengthening of what the book says is that CCI can be strengthened by giving it a secretariat. How do, you, how do you give CCI a secretariat? Move this, move this to this. You make planning commission the secretariat of Council of Common Interest, something which Prime Minister Modi in India has done four years back. So planning commission now is part of the Prime Minister's office. Uh, but of course, what we are uh, suggesting is a much uh, sort of a democratic uh, suggestion where CCI planning commission could be the secretariat to all the provinces if it is housed in CCI, not just the federal government. So this is the fragmented structure of economic governance. When you move from governance to accountability, the fragmentation increases. The accountability is now fragmented into much more institutions in this country. You have Public Accounts Committee, you have National Accountability Bureau, you have federal bodies for accountability, you have provincial bodies for accountability. And really, this is what the Supreme Court in this country is now asking, that with, with the presence of all these accountability, this, this entire ecosystem of accountability which we have created, uh, what's the outcome really? And the outcome is that you have created duplication, uh, multiplicity of accountability layers. And now when you go to the civil servant and ask him that against these objectives at the end of the year, you weren't able to achieve your KPIs basically. This is what they tell you. Number one, they tell you that it's not easy under this current environment. The question, follow-up question you, are, you ask, have you not been capacitated? Do you not have money? They'll tell you, no, I have money. I have budget. Uh, there's a reason that it can't be spent, you know. So when we were doing our key informant interviews in one of the programs, the civil servant said to us, I don't spend my budget, or I don't have a pressure from the top. And if pressure comes to me, and I what happens is, first of all, internally, someone comes to me, and inquiry karta hai ke ji you ne favor kar diya hai kisi ko chahe kiya ho ya na kiya ho aap internal inquiry se bachte hain to you land into jisko aap yahan pe kehte hain uh, audit and then public accounts committee uh, usse aap bachte hain to you land into what you call FIA usse aap bach jate hain aap replies dete rehte hain then you land into what you call uh, prime ministers or chief ministers anti corruption cells उससे आप बचते हैं तो आपको रुका आ जाता है नैब से और नैब से आप बचेंगे तो आपको रुका आ जाएगा हाई कोर्ट से सो वी हैव किल्ड द इंसेंटिव फॉर क्रिएटिविटी इंसेंटिव टू डू वर्क इन आवर पब्लिक सेक्टर सो व्हाइल सिविल सर्विस रिफॉर्म इज इंपॉर्टेंट द रिफॉर्म ऑफ अकाउंटेबिलिटी इज आल्सो इंपॉर्टेंट दिस इज द सेकंड एग्जांपल ऑफ फ्रैगमेंटेशन द थर्ड एग्जांपल इज इज इवन मोर स्केल्ड regulatory bodies and the fact that most of these regulatory bodies don't talk to each other. So economy ko regulate karna baat achhi baat hai, business ko regulate bilkul hona chahiye. But we really need to understand what to regulate, how to regulate and when to regulate basically. Bahut sare regulatory institutions ki shayad ab ahmiyat ho nahi hai. But still they continue to exist. So we have Sectoral regulators like NEPRA, OGRA, PTA, PEPRA, corporate regulators, financial regulators, provincial oversight regulators, business courts. Nothing wrong in having these regulators. The only thing I'm trying to find out in their laws is where do they talk to each other? Or if one business has multiple regulators ke letters ja rahe hai, aur wo business ke likh hai ke mein flane ko reply kar chuka hai, to should we really put our economic agents into all that misery. They will go multiple uh, notices. So just to summarize, the key argument of showing the past three slides was that there is a disconnect between the executive branch of the government, 
the regulatory bodies which we have and the accountability institutions. Or unless, unless they start talking to each other, we cannot streamline our economic governance going forward as per the constitution which I have just read. اس کے علاوہ ہم نے اب چار کیس سٹڈیز اس کی دی ہیں اس ایشو کی کہ اٹھارہویں ترمیم کے بعد جو ہے آفٹر دا ایٹینتھ امینڈمنٹ دا موسٹ ارجنٹ ریفارم ہیز ٹو بی دا ریفارم آف فیڈرل اینڈ پروونشیل ٹیکسز فیڈرل اینڈ پروونشیل پرائیورٹیز ان انرجی سیکٹر فیڈرل اینڈ پروونشیل ریفارم آف پبلک ایکسپینڈیچر سو ویری بریفلی اگر آپ دیکھیں اس وقت ٹیکس پالیسی جو ہے وہ سپلٹ ہے بٹوین فیڈرل اینڈ پروونشیل اور ٹیکس ایڈمنسٹریشن جو ہے وہ اس سے بھی کمپلیکس ہے کیونکہ اس میں فیڈرل بھی انوالوڈ ہے پروونس بھی انوالوڈ ہے اور سب پروونشیل یعنی ڈسٹرکٹس جن کو اب آپ لوکل باڈیز کہتے ہیں لوکل باڈیز آلسو ہیو سم پاورز ٹو کلیکٹ دیئر ریویوز اینڈ ان فیوچر دے ول آسک فار گریٹر پاورز یو نو سو گوئنگ فارورڈ ہاؤ ڈز پاکستان ایم ٹو ریفارم دا ٹیکسیشن This is of immediate nature کیونکہ اگر آپ ڈیٹا دیکھیں تو آپ کی سمال انٹرپرائزز اب گریجویٹ کر کے بڑی انٹرپرائزز نہیں بن رہی بیکاز اینولی دے ہیو ٹو پے ففٹی سکس ٹیکسز لیویز سر چارجز سیس اینڈ یہ جو ففٹی سکس ہیں یہ کسی ایک ونڈو پہ نہیں دینے کام آسان ہوتا ہے اگر ایک ونڈو پہ جا کے دے یو ہیو تھرٹین ونڈوز نا سو یو ڈونٹ ہیو ون فیڈرل بورڈ آف ریونیو یو ہیو تھرٹین ٹیکس اتھارٹیز ان دس کنٹری یو کین کم ناکنگ آف دی یو نو So that's case study one, which we discuss in the book with fair bit of detail. Case study two is the fragmentation in our energy sector. Kuch cheeze hain jo wafaq ne karni hai, kuch hain jo provinces ne karni hai. But we really, at the end of the day, aaj, if you, if you look at today's dawn, the figure of circular debt has crossed $900 billion. So I'm getting electricity at my house. I'm very happy that number of hours of load shedding have reduced. But very soon, very soon I'll be told that I need to pay those $900 billion. Rupees or dollars? Rupees, sorry. $900 billion rupees. Sorry. So, and if I'm not able to pay, of course, if consumers are not sort of burdened with this uh, amount, what happens is that government needs to issue an overdraft and load shedding comes back, right? Uh, which is what people have started expecting. So what we are saying is, Uh, that you somehow need to reform those generation companies as well as distribution companies which are in each of the provinces. There are some responsibilities which provinces need to undertake. What may those be? For example, the technical losses and theft. If somebody is stealing electricity, of course, the federal institution may not be able to go. The provincial level, the XC and SDO at that level, the accountability has to be created over there. It is there, by the way. Uh, Then the issue of hidden and cross subsidies. There are some subsidies to the energy sector or usage of energy sector which federal government is giving. There is some subsidy going to the same clients from the provincial government as well. Uh, so despite improvements in generation capacity due to CPEC, you are still seeing a large gap in transmission and distribution. That's the case study number two. And we have almost half a chapter discussing SDPI's work on, on energy sector. The third is, again, uh, where, of course, uh, we are trying to find a lot of answers. This is how public money is spent on the beneficiaries. It may be health expenditure. It may be education expenditure. Uh, so somebody approves that. For federal level spending, CCI, the approval comes to CCI. For specific provincial, of course, provincial assemblies can take a decision on their own. Provinces have their own prioritization committees leading up to annual development plans. In terms, in terms of recurrent budgets, ongoing coordination between monetary and fiscal policy, these are different stuff. And of course, ECC approves several of the expenditures. کل ہم نے شوگر امپورٹ کرنی ہے پرسون نے ویٹ امپورٹ کرنا ہے یہ وہ ڈسیزن یو پی سی سی دین یو ہیو نیشنل اکنامک کاؤنسل نیشنل فائنانس کمیشن اوارڈ کیبنٹ کمیٹیز این ایف سی کے نیچے ایکنک اینول پلان کوآرڈینیشن کمیٹی 
priority committees, departmental working committees, central development working committees, and then divisional committees, so on and so forth. The key argument. So the key argument here is, the finding was, and of course this is uh, a large part of this work comes from uh, Dr. Hafiz Pasha's supervision, which is provided to STPIS team. Every 100 rupee which is approved at the top, 38 rupees do not reach the beneficiary. So almost 40 rupees are not going down to the beneficiary. So the key argument of, of explaining all this, uh, this, this public expenditure management in the book is that we really need to see the supply chain, where are all these leakages, wastages taking place, you know. Not all of it can be corruption. Some of it just be mismanagement of financial resources, overvaluation or financial resources, you know. But this is a big number if 40 rupees is not reaching the beneficiary. Similarly, in our other chapter, we talk about implementing trade policy. While exports of Pakistan have been going down for so many years, we have now seen an uptick in exports, but a lot more needs to be done given that countries like Bangladesh, Vietnam, they've been performing very well under the same international climate, international prices, you know, they have been selling much more of exports, you know. So why is our trade policy not working? Why is it not delivering? Number one, because the, if you open up the trade policy, the rules and responsibilities for delivering the trade policy or the incentives under trade policy have been split across so many institutions and at the end of the day nobody is accountable. Whether exporters received the incentives or not, whether loans were given on time or not, whether the, the interest rate was pro-exports or not. Similarly, CPEC and the Chinese private sector wants to see an improvement in our logistics infrastructure, right? Our logistics score. Goods have to come from Urumqi, Kashgar, other areas, go all the way to Karachi and Gavadar. And unless we improve on our timeliness, tracking, logistics, international shipment, customs, uh, you cannot implement or, or you cannot fulfill the desires of your Chinese counterparts, which is one part of trade policy, of course. So let me now come to the, the reform approach which we have taken in the book. The first set of reforms is more immediate. It talks about reducing cost of doing business in the country. The second set of reforms <coughs> talks about that reducing cost of doing business is only a short term measure. You still need to find new levers of growth in this country. There have to be new sources of growth in this country. And then finally, to implement these reforms, as well as the new levers of growth, you need to reform the system of implementing your decision, implementing the decisions taken by economic managers. And of course, each one of them have, have details. And a large part of this work was, was actually uh, what we did in the last seven years in STBI, basically. These, these were the new levers of growth which which we have been promoting in this country. Many of you have been cited in the book. Those of you who have seen the book, uh, Shujat has a copy in case you want to read and borrow. Uh, no, no, I will uh, encourage everybody to buy it. Thank you. Trade and, trade and services, we worked a lot in STPI for three years. Uh, we worked, you know, helping SMEs graduate. We are currently working on this with uh, Ahad, Wasif, and their teams. In case of investment diplomacy, we had worked a lot uh, with our former teams, with uh, the Safwan and uh, Hamza. Uh, in transit services, we worked with, uh, of course, Rabia is, is even currently doing a project on this Rabia Manzoor. On social enterprises, women enterprise, again, Rabia and Ahad's team have been working on creative industries. We worked recently under the leadership of Mr. Shahid Kardasa. Uh, on reform of urban zoning, on judicial reforms of business. So all of these, this, these, these are things where SDPI's work has been sort of brought into one place, you know. We have really tried to crowdsource all those ideas from SDPI. Then intergovernmental relations 
is, is, is recent work, you know, the, 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 the three. How do you strengthen Council of Common Interest? How do you strengthen the current economic policy approval forums? What are those? National Economic Council, NFC, right? ECNIC, ECC. And then finally, how do you get around uh, reforming the system of public administration? Because at the end of the day, it is the civil service that has to implement all these things. Yes, so intragovernmental is, is, is equally important, uh, but uh, unfortunately the, the book doesn't discuss about this. Uh, our, our, our scope was intergovernmental, but uh, this point is extremely important because now when you are moving with local bodies ordinance in place, now when you are moving down from the provinces, uh, how do the districts talk to each other? So this is an equally important point. Uh, unfortunately, it's not been handled in the book. We didn't have that scope. So this is the approach to reform, which we basically explain. Uh, but the bigger question, of course, still remains. Uh, who will do this and how? Uh, yes, civil service. We stress upon the civil service reform, but the civil service is just one part of the entire implementation canvas. How is public policy implemented? It is a very huge subject, basically. You know? Who are the agents? Who are the actors? Uh, and this is what uh, we have two detailed chapters devoted to uh, answering this question. You know, um, And I think this is, while I can go on and keep on answering this question, but I think Mr. Shakil Rame would like uh, people to actually find the answers in the book. You know. So I'm answering the book and ask you the questions. So, so, I, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll just, I'll just, just so that they know. Uh, do we need to? Do, do we want to know the answer or? Uh? Yes. I think that's most important. Okay. Okay. So, <laughs> so why you will read the that book? They will not course. buy your book okay. if they know the answers. Okay. <laughs> no, I, I, I'm not going to give the answer. I'm just going to give, again, approach to this question. I'm not claiming that I have an answer. How do I approach this question, basically, is in two forms. And again, this is what we do in STPI. Uh, who will do this has to be first decide, decided by innovating our policy engagement methods in this country. Second, social accountability instruments. For example, one of the things that I cite in the book is how much time in the past one year the Prime Minister of Bangladesh gave to the President of Federation of Bangladesh Chambers of Commerce? How much time did Prime Minister of Bangladesh give to her business community in one single year? Compared to how much time did Pakistan's Prime Minister give to his business community or the representatives? You know? Given that there is a gap, I argue for more refined policy engagement methods. Second, how do you further refine social accountability instruments? Just saying that, yes, we are engaging with community, we are doing public-private dialogues, uh, there are scorecards which hold uh, uh, people responsible. Uh, Dr. Shahriyar is working on governance index, of course. These are all instruments which we are trying to refine. And this is the case that we make in the book. We need to keep on experimenting with new instruments. You know, uh, the, the, the most pressing reform that has, or, or the most urgent reform that has come in, in, in Pakistan uh, at different phases of history came through different sources of pressure which were created you know, on the policy makers. Uh, so I'm, I'm not talking about any activist sort of pressure. I'm talking about engagement, pressure and engagement mode, uh, 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 mode, you know. So people who don't know social accountability or the literature at, uh, around social accountability, I highly encourage you to read this discipline of demand side accountability going forward. You will find several answers and you will uh, experiment, uh, I'm sure, uh, these methods for your own policy recommendations when you engage with policy makers. So now we can take questions. Thank you. So the floor is open. So anybody have any questions?
and who will have uh, more questions, I will give him a, a hug, a special hug. So, so uh, in terms of the social economic indicators and governance indicators, yes. So we have done, uh, we have really mined a lot of data for the past decade. So you do see a lot of comparison with South Asia, with Central Asia, even with Latin American countries. Uh, because the nature of policy making uh, has some resemblance with a with, with cross section of developing countries. Yes. Yeah, uh, perhaps I have three points, but I think I will start only with one, and there is a possibility. Permission from Shipila. You know, uh, all along your presentation, um, I was keeping the title of the presentation in my mind, which says Beyond CPA. Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't figure out uh, how you approach this question in your presentation. Uh, my, my, my first uh, reservation is that, I mean, CPA is still, if I'm right, 20, 30, or 20, 35, it's 20 years. I mean, uh, what could be the basis which will qualify us to, to, to think beyond CPEC? Because, uh, I mean, the groundwork of CPEC has probably recently in last one or two days it has started. So uh, I, I really don't know. I mean, uh, what would be that, that basis? What would be that, that ground on which you may uh, come out with with what's going to be happening beyond sea. Mm. So this is, so I, I hope I clarify it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. So, uh, Doctor, so what I try to do is just to give, uh, what I've done is just to give a flavor of three different aspects, you know, which is, yes, beyond CPEC, the required structural reforms, and the need for competitiveness, you know, because our private enterprise is really not taking off, particularly at the SME level. But my key argument remains, who will be using the endowments, the infrastructure of CPEC? You know? uh, we are building energy, we are building um, roads, railways, ports. Ultimately, the dividend of CPEC lies if we can enable our private sector to use it. And if you don't have more startups coming, if you don't have more private enterprise coming in the country which can create jobs, if you don't have local SMEs coming, you know, uh, the endowments will remain underutilized. Just like the case study of Islamabad Lahore Motorway. Uh, when it was being built, and still if you look at the feasibility document, it projects the cash flows that there will be factories at, at, at 16 different locations across the Islamabad Lahore Motorway. Two decades down the road, there are no factories. So what happened to that entire feasibility uh, which was done in the mid-90s for Islam and the So That's the same argument. That's the connection with CPEC. That because the reforms for competitiveness of private enterprise, structural reforms of taxation, energy, labor market, environmental laws, for example, which private sector needs to adhere to, because those structural reforms haven't been expedited, uh, you don't have private enterprise growing in the country. And if they are not growing, uh, those energy houses, roads, and rails would be there, but underutilized. Sure, sure. Uh, um, Dr. Sahab, this is one of the, I think you should read the book by Mushtaq Khan, uh, Political Settlements, and um, Transition for uh, the, the limited, access or, uh, limited access order states towards um, open access order states. Why certain countries in developing countries, like for example in Latin American countries, do not make a transition towards competitiveness and growth. Mm -hmm. And he's been widely quoted these days uh, by uh, many organizations including Douglas North and mm -hmm. Mushtaq Khan. comes up with his explanation that you know, the political settlement theory is a theory which, which applies to uh, a handful of political elites who circulate economic rents between themselves mm. in order to maintain stability and reduce violence. Mm. And they deliberately do this not to com have more competitive organizations which can break this kind of cycle. 
So what happens is that you do business with people that you know already. So this becomes repetitive, and you you um, divide the, the you know the the, the buy among the, the players who are already playing the game, and leaving the rest of the society uh, you know in in, in, in dismal state of affairs, for example. And this political uh, th uh, theory can be traced back to 50s and 60s. You can compare this with Bangladesh or with any Latin uh, American countries why at a particular uh, moment in time they took a decision by, um, by putting these economic rents into more productive centers, which means more competitiveness, uh, more organizations, uh, uh, and not Pakistan where they, these political elites and, and with, with, uh, with bureaucracy and with army uh, sort of uh, prevented this kind of uh, arrangement within themselves. And this is one of the key uh, arguments that unless you have institutions which brings in this, which takes care of the informal economy and becomes more competitive become, becomes more transparent which what you were saying in terms of social accountability you are going to remain in this limited access, access order students it is a bit complicated it's a bit complicated it's not that simple but this is what the argument of Mustafa Khan and Douglas North and you know, Nobel laureate Douglas North and others mm -hmm. is so basically I, can I add one thing to what uh, Dr. Shahi has said it's also go back to Dr. Sharia. So once he said, in Pakistan you need to understand that one, you need to understand it's another theoretical one, as it's a relation-based one. Yes. So, so I think that can be a, another attribute which mm -hmm. can be discussed, Absolutely. before the relation-based one is playing a role. It's very easy to answer the question that Pakistan has a constitution, a democracy, a voters, so they are all, in a sense, modeled on the Western democracies. But the actual function, function of the state is under the clutches of this informal governance affecting the formal governance of Egypt. So you see this kind of patron client relations, corruption and all this seeping into the system, which you see apparently based on the Western democracies. This is what Very important. Yes. Any other question? Uh, sir, does this book captures uh, the policy formulation process? Yes, so, so this is what uh, I, I thought that um, given that Dr. Shahriyal has had raised this, you know, and, and it's a good follow-up question uh, because, uh, Dr. So what we have done is that in, in chapter two, basically, at the very start of the book, you know, the framework which we, has, which, which sort of we follow is, is provided in uh, Dixit's work of 2008, you know, uh, who actually defines, and, and then we don't come out of the scope, where he defines economic governance as processes that support economic activity and economic transactions by protecting property rights, enforcing contracts, and taking collective action to provide appropriate physical and organizational infrastructure. You know. So this is, this is the entire definition of, it, there could be different definitions of economic governance as well, you know. I just sort of made this as my starting point. And, and this goes back to what, what you are saying and what Mushtaq Khan is saying. So yes, uh, we have tried to capture a, lot, a, a large part of, of what your question basically asks for. Uh, Does this book talk about the 18th Amendment and how it has affected uh, the policy implementation and trade policies? and other relevant policies. Is it in a positive way or negative way that is part of this group? Yes. So, uh, so yes, one of the core objectives was to study uh, the post-18th Amendment uh, structure of economic governance at the federal and provincial level, you know. And uh, we believe that in terms of openness of the system, in terms of how much does the system respond to uh, the, the beneficiary, certainly, the system has opened up after the 18th Amendment. You have new committees where people, bottom up, people from the community can become part of uh, the decision-making process. Uh, but yes, there are cases where uh, federal to provincial transfers are involved, where transactions are involved, 
and uh, that has become more complex. For example, payment of taxes has become, or compliance with taxation has become more complex after the 18th Amendment. G. Um, sir, uh, my question is uh, regarding uh, has the scope and nature of economic reform in Pakistan improved uh, and expanded over the years in the sense that uh, especially uh, if we look at the shift from nationalization in the 80s, uh, in, in, in the 80s uh, towards uh, privatization in, in the early to late 90s, has that sort of impacted the way economic reforms are designed? No, I think uh, this is an important question. I believe that it has changed hugely. Uh, uh, the, the state now realizes that it's not uh, a matter of about strengthening uh, the government or strengthening the private sector. Uh, both need to work with each other to strengthen the economy. So you need uh, good markets and good governments. And both should go together if the economy has to work. You cannot have a weak market and a very good government the government then needs to do something about uh, the, the, the markets becoming competitive, fair, transparent. You also cannot leave the market forces on their own and have a weak government where it cannot sort of keep an eye or regulate the market activity. So the reform has to be uh, sort of hand in hand. Yes. Uh, Father, please. <coughs> Sir, you have highlighted that there are in the regulatory system, system. You also argued that uh, after the 18th Amendment, these permutations have been increased and also the compliance costs have increased. So do you think that uh, you need to reverse 18th Amendment? Or even a, even a harsh question that, do you think we you know, want to change the form of government from changing to towards this whole uh, localized and sort of decentralized system towards the centralized system some way mm -hmm. so that uh, those 40 rupees that are lost down the, uh, the road when transactions are going down, those are local governments, they can be saved. And as Dr. Sharia mentioned, that uh, all uh, elite is circulating the rents amongst themselves. So if we centralize them, that elite can be minimized and it, uh, somehow the leakages can be reduced. I, I don't think there is a need to reverse anything here. I think it, it was a good move. Uh, all that I am saying is that once we had moved towards uh, 18th Amendment, there was a promise that all changes to the laws which were affected by 18th Amendment would be completed by end of 2015. That is what was given in the operationalization of 18th Amendment. Those laws rules and procedures have not been completed up till now. Post 18th Amendment laws for all the functions which were devolved. It may be environment, it may be taxation, it may be uh, the, the governance of social sectors. We had to come up with modification or new laws after 18th Amendment. That process has not been completed. It was a time-bound process. The parliament had given itself time until 2015. So we just need to sort of expedite our work. The system isn't broken. The system is, is good. We are moving in the right direction. We just need to sort of uh, move fast, basically. If we move fast, then the highest cost can be done. Alfan, no trust. When we will be able to implement these reforms? Because in the current structure, we have the system, we have structural problems. And it seems to be not implemented in the current situations. So how do you see it will be implemented and uh, when you see it will be implemented mm -hmm. So you and I have to do it. So in the book I'm I'm not putting anything on the government. In fact I'm making the argument that we haven't shaped the political will uh, sort of in a way that urgency could be created for reform. So I am taking it as, as a student of uh, policy engagement, I am taking it on my own, uh, uh, basically, uh, that what is it that I could do, what is it that you could do to shape, number one, political will, number two, create an urgency for these reform which have been mentioned. And then we, we, we go into those examples of countries, even Pakistan, where there are pockets of success. 
where with the right kind of pressure which was created, uh, reforms came about. Uh, today when you go into, for example, institutions like Nadra, uh, I mean it's a breath of fresh air when you don't have to sort of um, sit around or wait for the queue and uh, I mean I went into a very small location of, of Nadra or a branch of Nadra and uh, my renewal my ID card renewal process was complete in less than 10 minutes. Uh, of course, uh, others may have a different experience, but pockets of success are coming. Uh, Sialkot in your private enterprise is a pocket of success. Sialkot is just saying that we will not wait for government's incentives or subsidies to come. We will do what we can do on our own. They went around to set up their own airport, which is one of the rarest examples in the world that a private sector has set up an international port. Next year, they are opening their own private airline. It's Sayal Air. Right? So these are pockets of success in Pakistan. So it's you and I who have to do it. Any other question? Okay, then you can. I'll first refer and then you can. I was just saying that all that process, is, uh, you speed up that process of introducing new rules and new uh, laws. Will the compliance cost want to be increasing further with the introduction of new laws? For example, if uh, uh, local UC Nazar, mm -hmm. UC chairman, he introduces a, a, in their uh, local languages called Chubi tax, mm -hmm. they were removed. Mm -hmm. So if he introduces that tax again, mm -hmm. so, so don't you think that uh, the cost no, it's a good question. No, we have to create it. Yes, you and I have to create it, you know. And how to create it, that's that's discussed in the book. How did other countries create it? So, so, uh, uh, so, 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 your question is very pertinent. I'm not suggesting to erect new laws or to bring in modifications. Maybe those laws have become obsolete and they're still there in the book. So, so we need to sort of remove, or I don't know what's the legal word, it may be called repeal, but I'm not sure if repeal is the right word. I'm not a legal person. We need to do away with those laws. So in case of taxes, the example which you are giving, we are asking to cut down, the, at, at least bring down the number of taxes to half. And we have discussed Turkey's case study where Turkey was able to reduce its indirect taxes, which, were, which had reached almost four dozen, to under 15, one five, over a course of 10 years. So simplification of laws, basically. We are talking about simplification of laws. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bakar, for your one hour. And I think it was very productive. One hour. I just we want to finish it here. Can, so I, I, can I, with your permission, because uh, when I'm presenting it elsewhere, uh, this is something that I wouldn't have done, but because I'm presenting it in STPI, so there are some STPI colleagues who need to be recognized, who have been recognized in the book as well, but I want to read their names. Sure. So what I write is, uh, <clears throat> my own research cited here would not have been possible without the authors of several of my co-authors of journal papers and colleagues who were part of research teams at STPI. These include, and of course these are the names of uh, several of them uh, who went around uh, at different times. And I, I sort of do this in the reverse order. Uh, Saad Rajput, uh, Saad Shabir, Ahsan Abbas, Muhammad Hamza Abbas, Huma Dad Khan, Muhammad Zishan, Samavya Batu, thank you. Safwan Aziz Khan, Fayyaz Yasin, Fazal Bukhari, uh, Saqib Shirani, Abdul Wajid Rana, uh, Rabia Manzoor, Ahad Nazir, Shujat Ahmed, Asif Javed, Muhammad Adnan, and then of course there are some of the colleagues who have left, but they're equally important. So I just want to mention now you can close. Thank you. Thank you.